die hanging on the words you say I've been known to give my all and jump in
church, y'all ready to have a good time tonight? Hey, before you guys sit down, hey, man, we're a family here. I want you guys to find somebody right next to you. Introduce yourself. Let them know who you are. We need to meet each other. You guys introduce yourself to somebody. After that, you guys can have a seat. I love it. You guys can have a seat now. <clears throat> awesome. Now nobody can say that they don't know anybody, right? We all know somebody now. Excited about tonight and kicking off part two of this. But for you guys that are new, my name is Parker. I'm one of the pastors here at Raider Church. What a privilege it is not only to get to hang out with you guys, but we're so excited if this is your first time that you have come to Raider Church to check it out. We're not gonna make you do anything weird. We want you to feel uncomfortable. The only thing I'm gonna ask you to do though, if you're a first time guest, is take that red card that was in your seat. I want you to fill it out, take all that information after the service, right out these doors and make a left or a right to the VIP Center. We have a free gift for you, it's a free t-shirt. It's our way of just showing you that we're excited that you're here. We also want to answer any questions that you guys might have. We want this to be your home. We say here all the time, welcome home. We hope this is a safe place and we hope you recognize it's filled with people who care. Also, if you're following us on social media, as always, excited you guys are hanging out with us as well. Make sure, as we do every week, if you have questions, prayer requests, we want to be answering those. We want to be praying for those. Let us know where it is you're watching from as well. And make sure and share that so that everybody else that you guys are connected to can experience everything that we're experiencing every single week couple of things before we get going. If you already know, because I feel like I say this every week, the Snapchat filter is still blowing up. Let's continue to use that. I know we had some issues last week, but it's back. Continue to use that. Um, also, if you're on, whether it's Twitter, uh, Facebook, Instagram, all the different things, share that feed. Uh, there's so many people that are asking how to be able to see that when you guys share it it hits it It hits it home. So you guys continue to do that also after the service so that you guys know Frio's popsicle place will be here again um, You guys can continue to take advantage of that We love the service and what it is these guys are doing and so you guys take advantage and one other thing that I want to do I wasn't planning on doing this, but it just made me think of it whenever I was standing out there man I want to really give a round of applause to our volunteers. Man, these guys are here early. They're setting up. They're rocking and rolling. Man. Guys, volunteers, everybody that's involved, from the bottom of my heart, I cannot say thank you enough. This wouldn't happen without you guys. You are the heartbeat of Raider Church. And so thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, we're fixing to get started in part two of GOAT, but there's something I want to kind of address. And... It's been a crazy couple of days with the things that have happened in Las Vegas and, and what's going on really just in our world. And so many times, guys, if we're being honest, we can kind of be numb to what's going on outside of our own little kind of home, right? Well, Las Vegas happened and, and guys, we've got some of our family, some Raider Church family that not only was there, but have been wounded, have been affected, have been very much traumatized. I met with a young lady last night, really connected in a way, but it just reminded me this is a different level of trauma. It's not just being scared. When you fear for your life, something else happens. And it just made me recognize and realize the desperation we need for Jesus and the prayer that we need to be given each and every one of these individuals. It's a scary thing. And there's evil in our world. And we have to be desperate for Jesus. But I want to pray for each and every one of these victims. It's a, it, it's a sense that, man, I recognize the safest place for them to be is in the hands of God, and, and I don't know what else to do besides intercede for them. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to get started. But if you guys would join me as we pray. You know, Father, just even sitting here, and it's, it is comfortable being here with family and recognizing man, just how blessed and how gifted and just everything that we get to get across. And it's just sometimes we can take it for granted. And Father, I, I'm praying that we never forget our need for you. Father, for Las Vegas and, and each one of these individuals and the fear and the trauma that they went through, both mentally and physically. Father, it's something, if I'm being honest, I can't comprehend, but you can. 
and you're the one that wants what's best and you're going to bring the peace and you're going to bring the comfort. And Father, I'm asking with everything that I have, all of us in this room are asking, Father, we're asking for you to intervene in the lives of each one of them, in their families, somehow, some way. We recognize, God, we can't change the past, but we can look to the future. And if we can keep our focus on you, Father, we know that you can bring us through anything. Father, evil is out there. And I'm just asking for each one of these individuals that it doesn't continue to torment them because you're bringing them peace. Father, let them experience you. Let them hear from you. Let them feel you. And Father, we're looking forward to tonight as well because we want to meet with you, God. We want to experience you. We want to hear from our Father. And so, God, we're looking forward to what you have tonight. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Our series that's launching next week, it's called Rock bottom. And in that series, we're going to be talking about what do you do when you hit rock bottom? See, the thing is, if you haven't been there before, trust me, there is a time coming in your life where you will hit rock bottom. It's just a matter of time where we will experience trials or suffering that will rock us to the core and we will hit rock bottom. And so next week, for the next three weeks, starting next week, we're going to talk about what you do when you hit rock bottom. So I hope you'll come every week for that series. Tonight we're continuing, finishing rather, our series called GOAT. We're talking about the greatest of all time. And when it comes to football, the greatest of all time, like the GOAT for football is clear. Okay. So let me just hear who the greatest of all time, the, the greatest football player of all time. Let me hear it one at a time. I, I have no idea what you said. Good try though. The clear, though, it's clear, okay? The greatest football player of all time. Here's the stats. See if you can guess who the greatest football player of all time. Here's the stats, okay? A career fourth best in NFL history passer rating of 97.1. Threw for 34,183 yards, 248 touchdowns, averaged nearly eight yards per attempt, had about... Four different discs in his back replaced, a couple shoulders, a couple collarbones, is none other than Tony Romo, okay? He's the best football player ever. It's clear. And listen, if, if you've got someone else, their only other names on that list could be like Troy Aikman, Emmitt Smith, or Michael Irvin, or I would even let you, I would even give you like Dak Prescott or Zeke Elliott, okay? They're, they're climbing up the list real quick, okay? But it's clear who the greatest of all time is. It's Tony Romo. Don't give me Joe Montana or Tom Brady, okay? None of that. It's definitely Tony Romo. Well, we are continuing our series talking about the greatest of all time really is Jesus. And we've been talking about why that is last week, and we're going to continue that tonight. You know, a lot of people question who Jesus was and where he came from and, and who is this guy. And he's doing all these miracles and all these people are following and thousands of people are listening to him. So, so who is this guy? In fact, Jesus even told the disciples at one point, everybody's wondering who I am. And they're trying to guess who I am and, and where I've come from. And, and they're trying to make sense of me. And he asked his disciples, he said, hey, who do you say that I am? And Peter spoke up and responded. And he said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And so we've talked about kind of the two parts to that. Last week, we talked about how Jesus is fully man and he's our high priest and how Jesus is for us. And tonight we're going to talk about the second part of that, that Peter said, you are the son of God. And so we'll talk more about that. But here's the thing, what you believe about Jesus and who he is drastically changes the way that you live your life. It drastically changes it. Like what you believe about Jesus, who he is and where he comes from, whether he's God or not, like that, those have major implications for the way that you live your life. And we'll talk more about that here in just a second. There's this one time, it was probably a couple months ago where we were at the mall, my family was at the mall, and we were having my wife's, uh, my wife Darby, her, her ring, we were having it resized. And so she was kind of trying on these different rings to figure out what size we needed to change her ring to. And I'm sitting there kind of leaning over the counter, and, and uh, my wife yawns like she's tired. And Levi, like the jeweler, is right across the counter from us. Levi, my son, he's 10. Um, and sometimes he, he forgets who he's talking to and where he is sometimes. But he, he speaks up as Darby yawns and, and, and says she's tired. Uh, my son, my 10-year-old son, God bless his heart, uh, 
speaks up and says, hey, mom, you know, when you wake up in the morning and you're tired, the look on your face, it's like you've been miserable your whole life. And I just die laughing. And the jeweler across the counter, he is dying laughing. Like, I kind of forgot where I was and who was talking and, and all that kind of stuff. Because we look over at my wife, Darby, and she's like, she's not laughing one bit. Like, she's not having any of it. But we are dying, like, miserable your whole life. Where do you come up with this stuff? Like, yesterday, my daughter, my four-year-old sweet little daughter, Nixie Poo. You guys know her name's Nixie Poo. And so, my sweet little daughter, she makes this huge mess in the living room. She makes a huge mess. And my wife, Darby, she goes, hey, uh, Nixon, you made that mess. You need to go clean it up. And she's like, no, you're just going to be happy I made the mess. <laughs> what? No. You, you, you don't, you guys are going to figure this out one day. Uh, when you have kids, you're going to realize they forget who they are sometimes. And they forget who they're talking to sometimes. Listen, the same thing is true with Jesus. What you're going to see tonight is that maybe... There's a lot more to Jesus than you ever realized. And sometimes we forget, or maybe we've never realized, who Jesus really is. And you see, when you realize and understand who Jesus really is and where he really came from, it changes the way you live, but it also changes the way that you approach Jesus. We talked about that last week, how Jesus is fully man, and as our high priest, he's for us. And so that changes the way that we approach him. When we mess up or when we screw up or when we're struggling, we don't have to run from him. We can run to him because he was made like us in every way. We said he was fully man, and so we can run to him because he understands our weakness. Well, you're going to see another part of who Jesus is tonight and how that affects our relationship with him and the way that we should act and live and talk to him and the way that we talk about him. So if you got a Bible, I want to show you. Acts chapter 2, you can turn there. Acts chapter 2, and if you don't have a Bible, or if it's not in a translation you understand very well, you can go to your uh, browser on your phone, go to RaiderChurch.com, select sermon notes, the verses are there, you can follow along with us. So Acts chapter 2, let me set this up for you real quick. In Acts 2, uh, the church is meeting together, it's the day of Pentecost, and as Jesus promised, they're praying and the Holy Spirit comes and says that it gives them tongues of fire. And they start speaking in other languages and all of this crowd of people gather around and they're trying to figure out what, what's going on here. How, how are these Jews like speaking all these different languages? Like I hear them speaking in my own language, yet I know they, they don't know that language. And so there's this crowd that gathers and they're trying to figure out what's going on. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 2 that Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, stands up. He raises his voice. He addresses the crowd and he starts preaching. And he starts talking about Jesus and who Jesus is and where Jesus comes from. And then he says this, watch this. He said, this Jesus, you put him on the cross. You put him on the cross. You killed him and he was the son of God. Well, this absolutely wrecks them. And watch what Peter says next. Acts chapter 2. Verse 36, he says, so let everyone in Israel know for certain. And, and what he's talking about here, he had just got through talking about how Jesus had risen from the dead. And, and he says, we're all witnesses of this. We all saw it. No one can deny it. We've all seen Jesus risen from the dead. We've all got family members and friends who saw Jesus risen from the dead. We, no, you can't deny this, Peter's saying. We're all witnesses of it. And so he goes on to say, so let everyone in Israel know for certain that God, watch this, has made this Jesus whom you crucified. Peter says, you crucified him. Your sin put Jesus on the cross, made this Jesus whom you crucified, watch this, to be both Lord and Messiah. God made this Jesus whom you crucified to be Lord. This word for Lord that's written here refers back to the Hebrew word for God, Yahweh. And so what the crowd would have understood Peter to be saying when he said, this Jesus whom you crucified, God has made that Jesus. He is both Lord and Christ. What the crowd understood Peter to be saying is, is that Jesus is God. And you put him to death on the cross. And 
And in case you're like, man, that must have stunk for them, like sucks to be you. You and I are not exempt. You see, Peter just got through saying that God planned all this in advance. In fact, the Bible says that it was God's will to crush him so that he wouldn't have to crush you for your sin. That it was God's plan to send his son to earth, Jesus, in the form of a man, fully man, yet fully God. And to die on the cross for their sin, but for your sin. And so in case you're like, man, sucks to be them, they crucified Jesus wrong. You might as well put your name in the blank. Jesus died on the cross for you, your sin, my sin, put him on the cross. And Peter says, the one you crucified because of your sin, God has made him Lord and Messiah like that's the son of God and you killed him. Well, you can imagine their response. The Bible says in the very next verse, they were cut, they were pierced to the heart. Like they were struck to their very core that my sin put Jesus on the cross. Now their sin may have been different than yours, but that's what they were realizing. That's what they were understanding. My sin, my mistake, I didn't realize who he was. I didn't understand that this Jesus was really God, the son of God. I didn't realize that. I didn't get that. And so my sin put Jesus on the cross. I killed him. Can you imagine feeling the weight of that? So it says they're broken. They're pierced. They're cut to the core of who they are. And you can imagine them. They say that the, the very next question is, so what do we do? Peter, tell us, what do we do? We killed the Son of God. What do we do now? And Peter says, repent of your sin, every one of you. And turn to Jesus and your sin will be forgiven. You see, the reason they were so broken, they were so cut, they were so pierced, they were so desperate. Peter, what do we do? We, we crucified the Son of God. Peter, what do we do? The reason they were so broken is because for the first time they realized this, that Jesus is fully God. We said last week that Jesus is fully man. Well, the Bible teaches that Jesus is also fully God. You may think, well, that's impossible. How could it be fully man and fully God? Well, if there is a God and he created everything and he can raise his son Jesus from the dead, this God can do the impossible. And so it only follows that Jesus' very existence as fully man and fully God would be impossible to us to understand as well. Lots of people have tried to come up with different illustrations, and there's, there's really no illustration for the impossible. That Jesus existed as fully man, yet he was fully God. You might say, well, how do we know? How do we know that Jesus is fully God? Glad you asked. First, fulfill prophecy. Fulfill prophecy. You might be thinking, what are you, what are you talking about? Fulfill prophecy. Well, in the Old Testament, watch this, nearly a thousand years before the time of Christ, Nearly a thousand years before the time of Jesus. There were prophecies about who Jesus, the Messiah, would be, where he would be born, how his friends would treat him, how he would die. Literally, that he would be pierced in his hands and his feet, but there wouldn't be a bone broken in his body. All those things were fulfilled in the life of Jesus. So watch this. In one psalm, there are eight prophecies about Jesus. And here are the chances of one man fulfilling those prophecies, okay? It's one times 10 to the 17th power. Just one passage, eight prophecies. One, if you're a mathematician, you get this. Some of you are like, huh? I don't know, let's see what. It's one times 10 to the 17th power. That's one with 17 zeros after it. Like a million is one with six zeros, right? 
And we're about to get into something I'm not really sure about, but it's like a billion's like one with nine zeros, I think, and trillions like 12, I think. And so, but, but this is one times 10 to the 17th power, one with 17 zeros following. That's the chances of one man fulfilling all those prophecies. Yet Jesus fulfilled them all. Things that were outside of his control. That's one passage. In the Old Testament, there are at least 48 different prophecies specific about the Messiah who would come and would be the Son of God. And so watch this. For one man to fulfill all 48 prophecies would be one times 10 to the 57th power. A one with 57 zeros following after it. It was virtually impossible, yet Jesus fulfilled them all. It's one of the reasons we believe the Bible is inspired by God, because who else could predict the future but God alone? It shows not only that the Bible is inspired by God, but that Jesus was who he said he was. Next, we have that Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit. He wasn't conceived by Joseph and Mary like hooking up, like they weren't married yet, okay? And um, when, when Joseph finds out Mary's pregnant, he realizes like, uh, Mary, we, we haven't had sex, so you clearly have been impregnated by someone else, okay? And there's this, there's this kind of this whole drama. You can go read it in, in Matthew and Luke. I mean, you can, you can read about it. Mary's embarrassed and, and, and castigated from the people because they think she's been impregnated by Joseph or someone else outside of marriage. But the Bible teaches that Jesus was conceived of the Holy Spirit inside of Mary's womb, that it was a miraculous conception. And Joseph believed it because he received a dream, just like Mary had received a dream, that the baby that Mary had was conceived by the Holy Spirit. So the Bible teaches that Jesus was conceived of the Holy Spirit inside of Mary. So that's one of the ways we know or believe, reasons why we believe Jesus is also fully God. Next, we have that Jesus claimed it. Jesus told the Jewish leaders, spiritual leaders, he he told them before Abraham was, I am. And he used the name, the Hebrew name for God, Yahweh, that no Jew would use or claim to be because that was considered blasphemy and you would be struck dead for doing that. And so when Jesus said this, it's why the Sanhedrin and the religious leaders wanted to stone him to death because he had committed the worst blasphemy, saying, claiming that he was God. He said before Abraham was, I am. He used I am, the word for God. That Moses, that God told Moses, when when Moses said, what's your name? Who who am I going to tell the people that sent me? God said, Moses, you you tell them I am sent you. Well, Jesus tells the Jewish leaders before Abraham was I am. Claiming that he was that same God that told Moses his name. We have Jesus telling the disciples and the crowds that would gather. He would say, the father and I are one. And so Jesus, when you read through the Gospels, he clearly claims it. And so he's either crazy, he's lying, or he's telling the truth. But there's no other way around that. He's crazy, he's lying, or he's telling the truth. You can't just say Jesus was a good teacher, he was a great guy. No, 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 no. He's either the son of God, he's a lunatic, or he's a liar. Those are the only options. Because he claimed to be the son of God. Next. He performed miracles. And you're like, oh, well, yeah, I mean, that's what the Bible says. Well, it's not just the Bible, actually. In fact, if you go back to a series we did in the spring called Grave Robber, we talked about how even the enemies of Jesus recorded and wrote that Jesus was a miracle worker. We have Jews and famous Jewish historians who have said that Jesus was a miracle worker. They didn't believe he was the Messiah. But they believed and said that Jesus, this Jesus guy, performed miracles that no one could explain. We have Roman historians, enemies of Jesus, saying that this Jesus guy was causing this uproar. He was causing this rebellion. He was known as a miracle worker. So it's not just the Bible that claims that. It's not just the disciples who ended up giving their lives, saying they saw these things happen. They were eyewitnesses. 
We have enemies of Jesus even saying that Jesus guy, he was a, he was a miracle worker. And Jesus told his disciples, he told his followers, hey, if you don't believe me, then believe the miracles. You've seen them, you've witnessed them, you've seen them with your own eyes. Believe the miracles. I'm the son of God. The father and I are one. Believe the miracles. And then last, we have that Jesus defeated death. We know that Jesus is who he said he was because he defeated death. No one else has ever done that. There's no other religious leader who's died and then been risen from the dead. Jesus is the only one. And again, in case you're like, how do, you, how do we know? I don't believe that Jesus rose from the dead. Well, you can go back online to our, our website, readychurch.com, and you can watch our series that we did called Grave Robber, where we go through all the reasons and the facts that most people agree on. And we use those facts to point in the direction of a resurrection. So you can go and watch that series. I don't have time to go into all of that right now. But the main reason, one of the chief reasons we believe that Jesus defeated death is because his disciples believed it. And they died as martyrs saying they were eyewitnesses to Jesus' resurrection. Now you're like, well, people believe things all the time that they don't understand. or People die for things all the time that maybe aren't necessarily true. And you'd be right. Except the disciples were in a position to know whether it happened or not. They said, we saw him, we touched him, we talked with him, we ate with him. In other words, they were saying, we know it happened. And we can't say it didn't happen because we saw it. We saw Jesus risen from the dead with our own eyes. And so we said in that series that liars make bad martyrs. Because no one dies for something they know to be a lie. And the disciples were in a position to know whether they really saw Jesus risen from the dead. And so for the disciples to die as martyrs, it isn't, they're not, you got to understand this. They're not dying for something that were told to be true. They were dying for something they were in the position to know whether it was true or false. And they died horrible, painful deaths saying they saw Jesus risen from the dead. And so one of the best pieces of evidence for the resurrection of Jesus from the dead is that the disciples died as martyrs, saying they eyewitnessed Jesus being risen from the dead. And you don't die for something you know to be a lie. Liars make bad martyrs. So we can be sure that Jesus is who he said he was. He is fully God. That's why Peter said in Acts chapter 4, There's no other name under heaven given to men by which we can be saved. There's no other name. There's no other person because Jesus is God. And Jesus said he's the way, the truth, and the life. And no one goes to the Father except through him. And so Peter said, because Jesus was the Son of God and because Jesus defeated death, there's no other name given to us by which we can be saved, by which we can be saved from our sin and experience eternal life. There's no other name but Jesus. Because Jesus was who he said he was. He was the son of God. He was the way, the truth, and the life. Paul writes in Philippians 2, so he was given the name that's above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ and Lord in heaven and on earth and under the earth, everything confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord. Every knee will bow. The only only part of that is if you'll do it now or if you do it when you stand before God and it'll be too late. Because the Bible says every knee will bow. If you don't do it now, you'll do it one day and you'll experience the fine, the punishment of your sin and eternity separated from God in a place called hell. If you don't bow your knee to Jesus this side of life. Because every knee will bow. Because God has made this Jesus both Lord and Messiah. You don't make him Lord. God made him Lord. And every knee will bow. So what does this mean for us? What does this mean for our lives, for like our our, our daily lives? Well, watch this. Paul said this in Colossians chapter one, starting in verse 15. He said this, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. In other words, Jesus is fully God. He's the visible image. He's the visible presence of God here on this earth. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. 
For through him, watch this, for through Jesus, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things that we can see and the things that we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Watch this. Everything was created. Everything. Everything on earth, under the earth, above the earth. Everything was created. You, me, every person in this room, you were created. For what? Through him and for him. You were created by Jesus and for Jesus. Did you know that's why you exist? You exist for Jesus. We said last week that because Jesus is fully man, Jesus is for us, like as our high priest, Jesus is for us. Well, because Jesus is fully God, watch this. We exist for Jesus. We exist for Jesus. You were created by Jesus and for Jesus. You exist for him. You might be thinking, well, what does that mean? Well, you were created by Jesus and you exist for Jesus. What that means is you were created for his pleasure. You were created to worship him, to follow him, to serve him. Your life should be about Jesus. You exist for him. It's why when we try to do life in the way that we weren't created to do it, like when we exist for other things other than Jesus, we find emptiness. We find pain. We find regret when we don't live our lives for Jesus because we're going against the way we were created. When you're not living for Jesus, you're only going to experience pain and regret. Because you were created by Jesus and you exist for Jesus. And whether we like that or not, doesn't really matter. Because the creation doesn't say to the creator, why did you do this or I disagree with this. We can only humble ourselves and submit to the creator in the way that we were designed to do this life or we can continue to run and reject the way that we were created, the way that we were designed to do this life. And you'll experience the pain and the emptiness and the grief that comes from that choice. You were created to exist for Jesus. You see, you may not realize this or not, but every person in this room, you're a worshiper. You might think, well, I don't believe in God. I don't follow it. No, 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 you're, you're a worshiper. You were created to be a worshiper. Every person in this room, you are worshiping something. You are for something. The question is if it's Jesus or if it's an idol. You know, what's interesting is when you go around the world to, even to the most remote tribe, they worship and pray to something. It might be a tree, it might be the sun, it might be the wind. But in every corner of the earth, even the most remote places that have never been touched by media, technology, or any other outside presence, you'll find in almost every tribe that they worship something. Because you were created to worship. God created you to worship Him because you exist for Jesus. But when you begin worshiping something other than Jesus, when you begin to exist for something other than Jesus, you're only going to find emptiness, pain, and regret. There's a guy that's been coming to Raider Church for a little while. His name's Ethan. And he sent me an email about his experience at Raider Church and how his life has just drastically changed here. And I want to read it to you because it was powerful. It's amazing. Ethan said this, he says, so I was raised in the church and I thought I was a Christian my entire life, but I never knew Jesus. I was seeking satisfaction from drinking and partying and girls and all of that just left me feeling like something was missing. Like maybe if I get more drunk tonight than I did 
last night that I'll really have fun, but nothing ever seemed to quite fulfill me. I thought, man, there was, there's got to be something more than this that's worth living for, but I didn't want to change. I remember last year moving to Lubbock, and I was so excited to be in a college town and thinking, oh yeah, baby, we're going to be partying every night. It's going to be lit. But I also saw this thing called Raider Church, and I thought, that looks pretty cool. I'll check it out. So for a while, I was doing the Raider Church thing and still trying to find a purpose for myself in partying and drinking, all the while knowing there had to be more. And then I heard that there was going to be Raider Church on a Friday night, and for some reason I had to go. I was talking about last year, our parents' night. And he came on parents' night. So that night, all my buddies were asking me, Hey, where do you want to go out tonight? What bar are you wanting to go to? And I said, Raider Church. And they looked at me like I'd lost my mind. But I knew for some explainable, unexplainable reason that I had to go. So I get to Raider Church and when worship started, I was absolutely wrecked. I didn't know why, but I had my hands up while we were worshiping and the craziest thing happened to me. God spoke to me and said, this is what you were created for to worship me, to know and to have a relationship with me. And right then I completely surrendered my life to Jesus for the first time because I knew, I finally knew I had a purpose, a reason to live for something more than myself and that the one who created everything desires to know me. So when that happened, all of my desires to chase after all of the things of this world were gone and in their place was a burning desire to know Jesus. Jesus is so much greater than anything in this world. And he is worth living for. Can we give a hand for what God did in Ethan's life? It's amazing. And I think there's a lot of Ethan's in the room tonight. You're living for things other than Jesus. You're worshiping things other than Jesus. You're existing for things other than Jesus. And can I tell you this tonight? Until Jesus is first, until Jesus is who you worship, until Jesus is who you live for, you're not going to be able to enjoy those things the way that you were created to enjoy those other things. Listen, there's no guy, there's no girl, there's no marriage, there's no job, there's no amount of money, there's no house, there's no car. None of those things will be properly enjoyed until Jesus is number one, until he's first. Those things will leave you feeling empty until you're worshiping and existing the thing that you were created to worship and to exist for, and that's Jesus. And so some of you are worshiping, you're existing for the things Ethan was worshiping, the things Ethan was existing for, and you're finding them, I believe, empty. And you're thinking, there's gotta be more. There's gotta be more than this, and there is. It's found in a relationship with Jesus. That's the way you were created to do this life. That's the way that you were designed to do this life. And so here's what I want you to see tonight. Because Jesus is fully God. He alone is worthy of my faith and worship. You exist for Jesus. You were created by Jesus and for Jesus. And because Jesus is fully God, he alone is worthy of your faith. He alone is worthy of your worship. There's this guy named Sean, and uh, he's a custodian here at a church in town called Experience Life. And this last week I, I heard that Sean, when he's asked what he does for a living, he tells people he cleans toilets for Jesus. And he tells them that he's a part of a church that makes disciples. And that's his job. He was doing his job as a worship to Jesus. And so here's what I want to challenge you to do this week. Is to find some things you can do that may seem meaningless or mundane and do them as a worship to Jesus. I want to challenge you this week. Go on Spotify and look up the Raider Church playlist. We've got a playlist of the songs that, that we do here all the time. 
and get by yourself and worship God just on your own, whether it's in, in your room, in a closet, at, at the park, wherever it is. Just get by yourself and spend some time worshiping Jesus. It's what you were created to do. And I bet you'll be shocked at the peace and the joy and the satisfaction and the fulfillment you will find in the presence of God. Because Psalm 16 says this, that in the presence of God, there is joy and there's eternal pleasure at his right hand. Because you were designed to do this life. You were created to worship worship Jesus, to exist for Jesus. Let's stand. We're going to worship God. We're going to spend some time doing the very thing we were created to do. And we're going to have prayer teams all over the room. They've got orange glow sticks on. They're here to pray with you. And so maybe you're here tonight and you identify with Ethan's story. I, I would challenge you, go to one of those prayer team members and, and tell them, hey, I'm just like Ethan. And I've found that life is totally empty and meaningless. And I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to become a worshiper of Jesus. Or maybe it's that you've been running from God. You've been rejecting God. You've been rebelling against him. And tonight you want to say, man, I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to bow my knee to Jesus. Because Jesus is the name that's above every name. And every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. You know, in Matthew chapter 2, there's three wise men. They hear about the birth of Jesus, this Messiah. And it says the wise men come and they enter the room. They come into this stable where this baby is laying in a manger. And he's wrapped in swaddling clothes. And these three wise men come into this manger and they bow down. They bow down to this baby because they know that this baby is Jesus Son of God, that He is God in the flesh, and He's worthy of their worship, even as a baby. And so they bow down, and they offer their gifts. And so tonight, as we worship, I want to challenge you in your heart, bow down and worship Jesus, and offer your gift, your life. Surrender your life to Him, because He's fully God, and you exist for Jesus. Come on, let's worship.
law is not going to change it. Jesus, only you will change where we live. Only you will change this world. And so, God, tonight we cry out to you. We declare this in this place. You have no rival, Jesus. This is what we were created for, to sing to you. We worship you.
says when he returns, we will be with him, he will be with us, and he will wipe away every tear from our eyes. There will be no more pain, no more sickness, no more death, no more sin, no more cancer, no more shootings. All these things will be gone forever. And so Jesus says, I'm coming soon. I'm coming soon. The time is drawing near. And John says at the end of Revelation, yes, Lord. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that you are coming back and you're going to make all things new. That when that trumpet blows and heaven cracks open and you come down to earth, you will take everything that is broken and you will heal it and you will make it new. And so we worship you, Jesus, as the one who's coming, the one who's coming back to rescue us, to save us, to heal and to restore.
just to think for a second through that message and we get to worship this God and there's so many of us that struggle with feeling whether or not we're worthy of it but we learn tonight that we were created for it powerful powerful thing and, and, and there's some of you here that just like when Clay was talking you're created to worship and, and, and just like Ethan's story God's drawing you to him Maybe you've never put your trust in Jesus. And if tonight's that night, I want you to take that card. I want you to fill out that card and, and check on there. I'm committing my life to Christ. And then take it to the Next Step Center after so we can talk with you and answer questions and pray with you. Greatest decision you can make. Let's be worshipers this week, man, in everything that we do, right? Let's make this week one of those weeks that we get to experience Jesus because we're doing what we were created to do. And that's worship God. But you guys, other than that, man, as always, have an awesome week. And we cannot wait to see you guys next week start the new series. You guys have an awesome week.